learning together because we all have different experience levels, which I think is really cool and really beautiful too. Yeah. So I think when a lot of people think about Wisconsin, they think of it as a very white state. I think I've seen the demographic breakdown that the African American population is somewhere around maybe 11% of, mm -hmm. of Wisconsin. What do the demographics look like within Milwaukee? Yeah. So we're about, I think, 40% or so in Milwaukee. When you add in our Latinx brothers and sisters, Mm -hmm. um, we are a majority minority city. And I think that's important to really uplift and to highlight because you look at who is in office um, and we have, you know, people of color that are representing us, but sometimes like they aren't always really being held accountable to the communities that they represent as well. Mm. You know, Mayor Barrett has been in, in office for, you know, several terms now. But you look at the history of Milwaukee, we have never elected a black mayor, which is fascinating. And a lot of people don't know that we've mm -hmm. had an appointed mayor to finish out the, the interim several years ago, but we've never actually elected a black mayor. And I think we, you know, there's been some rumors about our mayoral race that'll be coming up in 2020 and who's going to throw their hat in the race. And, you know, is that going to be the year where we finally elect a black mayor? So it's interesting, like when you think on, you know, demographics and numbers, obviously not all people of color and not all, you know, black folks, we're not a monolith. We all don't agree. Um, mm -hmm. But really, what would it look like if we all came together and really acted and demanded of our elected officials that we are a majority minority city and that people needed to pay attention and, you know, enact policies that, that are in our best interest? Has gerrymandering been a problem in statewide races in ways that affect communities of color and their ability to have their voices heard at the state or federal level? Absolutely. I think, I, you know, I look at some of the elected officials' districts and they are cut so interesting. They're cut so <laughs> weird. They have, you know, part of a suburb, but also like the inner city, just, you know, tale of two cities within their own district. And so I think that also reinforces, you know, Democrats being in the minority um, in every level, right? And so when you look at who is in power and you look at you know, the Democrats, it's it's hard for them to, to do anything. It's hard for them to, you know, pass bills and to push bills that have positive impacts on communities of color. Even today, you know, Scott Walker is pushing for a special session to do an overhaul of welfare reforms in our state. And I watch some of the live stream and it's, you know, it's ridiculous what they're trying to do, you know, with food share and, you know, making sure, you know, there's no fraud. And so we have to make sure that there's, you know, photo IDs so people can't share their food stamps with other people. Um, just things that are, you know, completely ridiculous. And so that's what that's what happens to communities of color where we're not able to have fair districts. You have people typically white men that are kind of calling the shots who don't have our best interests at heart, right? And are just doing whatever they want because they have that power to do so, unfortunately. Yeah, it still blows my mind that Paul Ryan is representing a district so close to Milwaukee. <laughs> yep, all the time. And his district specifically um, has 11% Latinx voters. And so, you know, there are some immigrant rights folks in groups that constantly are banging the drumbeat in his district and going into his office demanding clean dream acts and all the time because there's 11% of, you know, Latino folks that are in his district. And it's, it's just like fascinating because he has the ability to completely ignore a large population of folks. But yeah, you're right. Being so close to Milwaukee, it's just, it's, it's interesting. It just kind of goes to show that there's a little bit of no regard of, you know, actually listening to your constituents and you can do what you want and think that you can act without being held accountable. But I think, you know, times are changing in this resistance movement. I think more and more people are, you know, joining this level of resistance. I argue that there is a level of resistance that's been going on for centuries, right? But, you know, more and more is happening and more and more people are joining this drumbeat to push back. And so having like this diverse and inclusive movement, I think, is really starting to, to shake some things up a bit, specifically in Paul Ryan's district. It's about time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, indeed. <laughs> I, I feel like Paul Ryan doesn't care about the interest of anyone but Paul Ryan and Absolutely. possibly his donors. <laughs> yeah, yep, that, that's pretty much it, unfortunately. But that's how it works nowadays, right?
One of the issues that I know really affects Wisconsin in general is the opioid crisis. And Mm -hmm. people tend to think of the opioid crisis as sort of a white rural problem, but we know that's not really the case. Is that something that's affecting the Black community within Milwaukee? I think so in in a different way. I think a lot of folks, when they think of the opioid crisis, um, specifically in, in Black Milwaukee, people always think of like the crack epidemic. And what does it look like to invest all of these resources and people, you know, denouncing this as a public health crisis? But when it happens in, you know, in the 90s in the Black community with the crack epidemic, there was no help for that. There was no public outcry. And so I think people are thinking of it in that regard. Mm. And even when you look at, you know, mass incarceration, you know, there are people that are locked up for small amounts of of marijuana, right? But yet that's not being, you know, talked about. So I think there's a different, like, level to it. I think there is the stigma that opioids pretty much just affects, you know, rural white folks or, you know, suburban white folks. But it's also kind of bridging this gap and having a holistic conversation about this war on drugs and who is it really targeting and who are we sympathizing and saying, this person should get treatment versus who are we criminalizing and who do these people look like, right? I think that's kind of the broader conversation. And you've mentioned a little bit about officer-involved shootings. Is that a sort of growing problem in Milwaukee? Is that something that's always been there? What do those tensions look like right now? Yeah, you know, I think it's hard to say if it's a growing problem. Like statistically, I don't know if it's a growing problem. What I will say is that we're living in this time in the last, you know, seven or eight years where there's just more and more attention. There's more and more people paying attention. You know, I think if this would have happened, you know, 10, 15 years ago with the officer involved shooting, I think some people would give the officer the benefit of the doubt of, you know, it was it was an accident, it was a fortunate tragedy, we'll move on. But I think now we're really starting to like peel back the layers of, you know, implicit bias and and what does it mean to have these these policies, um, this over policing and over incarceration of communities of color. And I think, you know, whether it's through social media and being able to videotape um, these instances that are happening, a free exchange of information and being able to have a magnifying glass on it, I think it's increasing the tension. I don't know if it's actually increasing the officer involved shootings or if we're just talking about it more. Mm -hmm. And so the tension is, you know, a lot of outrage. I think there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of trauma. We we talk at Block a lot about thriving. And, you know, I've done some some school presentations with folks. We ask, you know, the seniors to think about, like, their future. What are they worried about? What are some issues they care about? And some of them would be, I want to get into college. I want to pay for it. I want to have a good job. You know, all these different things. And one young man, it it struck me. He was like, I'm just trying to stay alive and not get shot by the police. And he was 16. And I was like, that is not something that 16-year-olds should have to think about. Um, And I think, like, the conversation has evolved from generation to generation, and we're being more aware. You know, um, parents are having more conversations of what to do if you're stopped by the police. Um, where those weren't conversations that we're having, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And so I think people are more aware just because things are so heightened and there's just a lot of hurt, right? And so when someone does get picked up by the police or is, you know, detained or harassed or, heaven forbid, like murdered, it, it just opens that wound again. And, you know, people feel again, like, why should I participate in anything, right? Like the police are harassing me. I'm struggling to, to, you know, provide for my family. I'm just going to keep my head down and just try to do what I can to survive, um, which is, I think, very difficult. And it's, it's tough to hear that, you know, but having so many Black men locked up and dealing with mass incarceration, it's, it's a really trying time. And Milwaukee being home to the most incarcerated zip code in the country, you know, makes it difficult. And again, there's a political angle to that that, you know, we're locking up these Black men and thus reducing them from the voting population as well, right? So it kind of just reinforces, again, these policies of being able to criminalize, you know, Black and brown folks for merely existing. And people see that. People are connecting the dots. And it just further, I think, turns people off and alienates people from the political process. And people are just literally trying to survive. People aren't thinking about thriving People are, you know, just trying to be less poor and just get by day to day. 
and can't think about anything long term, unfortunately. So I think there's there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of hurt, and there's a lot of pain, but I think part of it, we get used to it. You know, there's an officer involved shooting. We, you know, we protest, we take the streets, we heal, we grieve together. And then a couple months later, we hear that there's going to be no indictment. There's going to be more, you know, marches and protests. And then they die down. And then the next officer involved shooting happens. And it's just, it's a cycle. And we almost kind of get used to there being no indictment. But what does it mean to really take that energy and harness it um, and really fight back? And I think that's something that Black is, is always thinking about and trying to address too. Has there been any movement within the Milwaukee Police Department to try to do more trainings or anything with their police officers? You know, I think if you ask the outgoing police chief, he'll say yes. You know, he wants to do all of these things. We have a fire and police commission, which is supposed to be a citizen oversight board appointed by the mayor. So we have mechanisms in place, but they're they're not working, right? And that also means you know, that's that's the way for the police chief to say, well, we have to do these things. You need to give us more money, right? And using more money mm-hmm. needs more police mm-hmm. officers. I, for one, am not a fan of funding the police more. And my taxpayer dollars going to further criminalize my own community. But, you know, I don't think we're having this broader conversation, at least in a, in a mainstream way, of what does it look like to, you know, what if we took 5% or 10% of police resources and invest that into youth programs, and invest that into mental health. Um, let's address like the root causes that are producing this crime instead of investing it in police officers that are only responding to crime. They don't prevent it, right? So mm-hmm. I think depending on who you ask, like people think that they're willing and open to do that, but it's also an excuse to, to fund the police more, which is not something that we are in favor of. So if people would like to help get involved with the work that your organization is doing, you know, do you take donations? Are there ways that they can help amplify your message on social media? Yeah, both of those things. So we definitely welcome donations wherever, you know, people can give, whether it's $1, $100, whatever in between. We definitely appreciate that. So we have a donation link on our website, which is blockbyblock.org. There's also a way to fill out a contact form if people locally want to get involved or any other way for folks to reach out to us. And then we're on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Block by Block Milwaukee. So feel free to, you know, shoot us a message, amplify the work that we're doing. We also try to amplify some of our coalition partners as well, but it's also a really good way to, you know, kind of stay informed on some of the issues too. And we really try to shed a light on some things that are happening locally in Milwaukee as well. And we'll be sure to put those links up on our website as well. Is there anything else that you think might surprise our listeners about Milwaukee or about your organization? Hmm. You know, I will say that, you know, being a new organization and being a new executive director and people seeing that we're a group of all black women, a lot of people ask me if that was intentional. And I'm like, no, but it just worked out conveniently (laughs) that way. I just really want to uplift that I think this is the year of, you know, Black women, people really taking the lead and and really listening and amplifying the work that Black women are doing. You know, we look at what happened in Alabama. We look at, you know, you can look at all the exit polling and who voted for what party and it's Black women that consistently have shown up and saved the day. And so I think it's, I'm very fortunate that it kind of just worked out that we're a staff of, at least right now, of all Black women. And of course, we'll welcome folks when we expand, but I think there's something really special and really telling, I think very timely with kind of this narrative, people starting to wake up and understand that Black women are here. We do, you know, the laborist work and the grunt work and having the boots on the ground. And I think Black is also kind of just a a representation of that as well. That's exciting. And it's been exciting to see so many Black women running for office in 2018. Yes. We've actually endorsed two candidates. Our our only two endorsements that we've had so far have both been Black women who are running for county supervisor in Milwaukee. And they're phenomenal women. One of them, Sparkle Ashley, she's actually running against an incumbent who's just like deeply racist and problematic on so many levels. So we're rooting for her so hard. And Felicia Martin, um, she's phenomenal. She's been an activist for a very long time and really active in her community. So we're you know, happy to support them as well as as candidates too. 
And I saw that you were involved in Emerge Wisconsin yes. and working with their diversity efforts. What does that look like helping them with the with diversity efforts? 